My name is Ying Gao and welcome to Dr. Gao's classroom. I'm a professional philosopher and I love classical Chinese poetry. I have been teaching and translating classical Chinese philosophies for many years and poetry for the last few years. I'd love to share my knowledge on the subject with you. Your enjoyment is my command. Today, I'm going to take a break from the series of poetry from Frontier while I'm preparing for more videos on the topic. I'm going to introduce another great poet from the Tang Dynasty, who was a close friend of both Li Bai and Wang Wei. His name is Meng Hao Ren. I mentioned his name several times in my videos on Li Bai and Wang Wei, as well as my last video about Wang Changling. He was not successful in pursuing a political career like Wang Wei. This perhaps had a lot to do with his personality and character. On one hand, he sort of think that the politics corruptive to one's integrity, a bit like the famous philosopher Zhuang Zi, and expresses this feeling openly in his poetry. Yet, on the other hand, he attempted quite seriously to get into the bureaucratic system by building up his literary reputation and dedicating his poems to high rank officials. He was torn between these two incompatible goals all his life and missing several very good opportunities to be recruited. In one occasion, by the emperor himself. What happened during these few occasions are quite comical when you come to think about it. It is indisputable that Meng Haoran was an excellent poet, and his poetry had a huge impact on poets like Li Bai, Wang Wei, and even Du Fu. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Meng Haoran's life and translate and analyze two of his best known poems. In my next video, I'm going to continue my talk about Meng Haoran's life, and I would also talk about his friendship with Li Bai and Wang Wei, as well as translate Li Bai's poem praising Meng Haoran's poetic talent and integrity. And the poem upset the emperor, and followed by a few antidote how Meng Haoran ruined the best opportunity to join the bureaucratic ranks. If you're new to my channel, please check out my other videos on classical Chinese philosophies, poetry, and medical literature. If you like the content of these videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online license on this subject, so if you would like to read the original text or any other material I mentioned in my videos, please contact me. Here's my email address. Now, let me go back to Meng Haoran. Meng Haoran was born in 689 AD into a rich land-owning gentry family in today's Hubei province. He started his schooling at age of nine, learning about poetry and martial art. This was quite late at the time. I recall Wang Wei was already composing poetry and essays by the age of nine. But Meng Haoran was a smart kid. He topped the qualification examination at his county for civil service examination by the age of 18. That was quite an achievement at such a young age. A normal path for a young scholar at the time was to prepare and then take the regional civil service examination for the title of Ji Ren or the recommended scholar, and then proceed to pass the national exam at the capital of Chang'an and then join the ranks of scholar officials. This was the path Wang Wei, Du Fu, and many others took. However, Meng Haoran decided he did not care for a political career. Instead, 
He moved out his family estate and married the most beautiful cottagean from his county and settled into a semi-retired life at Lu Men Shan or Mount Deer Gate, a beautiful mountain range that boasted a cultural tradition for Taoist and Buddhist hermits since the Han Dynasty with many Taoist and Buddhist temples and monasteries. I can imagine how disappointed his parents would be even though there were no record about the fight he might have with his parents. But the fact that Meng Haoran moved out of his family estate gave us reason to suspect that he probably had a huge fight with his parents. Because it was quite unusual for an 18 year old to move away from his parents home and set up his own home in China even today. And I can't see any reason that his parents would approve his marriage to a cottagean instead of a proper lady from a good family. Such a marriage at his time would certainly bring disgrace to himself and his parents. Nonetheless, at his estate in Lu Men Shan or the Mount Deer Gate, Meng Haoran enjoyed a relaxed and comfortable life while building a reputation for himself as a poetic talent. The following poem was supposedly composed during this time. Here is a beautiful calligraphic work for this poem. Now let me read it for you. 春眠不觉晓,处处闻啼鸟。夜来风雨声,花落知多少。Now, let's look at the first two lines. 春眠不觉晓,处处闻啼鸟。春 means spring, 眠 means asleep, 不 means not. 觉 normally can be translated as wake up, but it can also be interpreted as become aware or realize. Here my colleague and I translate it as realize. 小 means down. 处处 means all around. 闻 means hear. 啼 means sing. 鸟 means bird. So the two lines read, Asleep this spring night, I don't realize it is dawn, with bird song all around. 夜来风雨声,花落知多少? 夜 means night. 来 usually means arrive, but it is also used as a adverb meaning since, as in the phrase of 以来. So, Ye Lai here is an abbreviation of Zhuo Ye Yi Lai, or since last night. So, we translate the phrase with both meanings in mind. Feng means wind, Yu means rain, Sheng means sound. Hua usually can be translated as flower, but here it refers to the petals of the flowers. Luo means fall. However, given the textual context here, that the poet expresses a subtle melancholy, my colleague and I change our translation to remain rather than fall, you know, the literary translation of fall. Remain also rhyme with rain. Isn't this wonderful? Zhi usually means to know or knowledge. However, here it is used in combination with duoshao, meaning the poet did not know but wonder how many petal has fallen since last night. And duoshao, of course, means how many. So the two lines read, Last night arrived with the sound of wind and rain. I wonder how many petals now remain. As you can see, the poet did not need to get up early as all the other scholars of his age, 
who would get up at dawn after washing up, start their days by chanting classics or poetry to prepare for their exams. Officials would also have to get up early to attend the morning sessions with the emperor or attending their duties. The farmers also had to get up early to attend their crops, etc. Everyone had to get up early except Meng Haoran, who slept until he was woken up by the bird singing outside of his window. What a wonderful life! He would be envied even today by many 18-year-olds who had to get up early to go to school. Of course, he was a bit sad that the spring was almost gone, but he restrained his feeling and only expresses the melancholy in the scene of falling petals of the spring blossom. This is quite normal for a poet of his age, you know. It was cool to be a bit melancholic when you were eighteen. So, this poem was a huge hit at the time. It certainly has a lot to do with the elegance of the poem. Even though Meng Haoran used the simplest language, the whole poem flows so naturally, like water flows from a high place to a low place. It is beautifully crafted. But without a trace of effort, this is probably the highest art of poetry. I could only exclaim, "Ru you shen zhu," or the poet must be assisted by a divine force. Meng Haoran lived this carefree life until seven seventeen, when he turned twenty nine or thirty, according to the Chinese calendar. Thirty is a critical age for a Chinese young man. Confucius reported that he 三十而立 meaning that he had established himself as a scholar at the age of thirty. So, for any Chinese young man, if you haven't found your place in the society and built a livelihood for yourself by thirty. The shame is unbearable, not just for yourself, but also for your parents. Or at the very least, you should be trying to build up something for yourself. It was probably that Meng Haoran could no longer resist the pressure from his family to have another go at getting into the bureaucratic ranks. So he took the usual step of. Gan Ye, that is, to present a poem or essay to a high-rank official expressing his desire to be recommended to join the bureaucratic system. So he sent this poem to the then premier Zhang Yue. Now let me read the whole poem in Chinese first. 八月湖水平，含蓄混太清。气蒸云梦折，波撼岳阳城。欲济无舟楫，端居此圣明。坐观垂钓者，徒有目以情。Now let's look at the first two lines. 八月湖水平，含蓄混太清。八月 means August. 湖 means lake. 水 means water, 平 means level, 寒 means to contain something inside, 虚 means emptiness. Here it refers to the reflection of the sky. 含蓄 means the lake contains the sky's reflection. 混 usually means mixed up, as in the phrase of 混合 meaning mixed together. Or blurred, as in the phrase of 混淆 meaning blurred distinction of two things. 太清 is a Taoist term refer to the heaven, but here it refers to the sky. So this line describe a scene where the reflection of the sky in the lake meets the sky. 
But this scene is what the poet saw at the time, so we insert the subject and translate it as a subjective experience. So the two lines read, In August, Dongting Lake is level. I cannot tell where the sky meets its reflection. Qi zheng yun meng zhe, bo han yue yang cheng. Qi means vapor, zheng means steam, yun means cloud, meng means dream, zhe means wetland. Yun meng zhe was a huge wetland consists of many lakes and rivers located in today's Hubei province. It has a rich cultural heritage and figured prominently in the classic literature. Bo means wave, Han means ripple against. Yueyang is a city located in today's Hunan province. Cheng means wo. So the two lines read, Cloudy dream wetland steam, waves ripple against Yueyang city's walls. These four lines are absolutely beautiful. It draws a panoramic view of the Dongting Lake in a grand scale. You can imagine an overflowing lake where the water levels with the banks and expand to the skyline where the sky's reflection on the water meets the sky itself. And the vapor steaming from the wetland around the lake blurs the horizon line between the reflection of the sky and the sky. The huge Yeyang city seems shaking while the waves ripple against its wall. What a magical sight! This magical scene should be followed by magical figures such as some sort of immortals or fairies, but it abruptly followed by a complaint. Now let me read the next two lines. Yi ji wu zhou ji, duan ji chi sheng ming. Yi means want, ji means cross, wu means haven't, zhou means boat. Ji means paddle, Duan means proper, Ji means live. Duan Ji means living a life without hardship as in the phrase of An Ji meaning living peacefully. But here it is used in a negative sense meaning laying about and not contributing to the peaceful life the poet is enjoying. Sheng Ming means a shadely or beneficent ruler, so we translate the term as beneficent rain. So the two lines read, I want to cross the lake but have no boats or paddle. I'm ashamed to be lying about in this beneficent rain. These two lines said more than what are in the letters. It is a subtle complaint that he is eager to contribute, but hasn't found a way to do so. He is not ashamed by the boasting that he has the talent to make a substantial contribution if only someone introduced him to the emperor. The implied request for a recommendation is so twisted, it's very hard to figure out. This is what we would call passive-aggressive today. It, it just feels very uncomfortable. I bet the Premier Zhang Yue probably feel the same way. Well, the following two lines are even worse as a Gan Ye poem. Zhuo guan chui diao zhe, tu you mu yu qing. Zhuo means sit, guan means Watch. Chui diao zhe means fisherman. Tu means can only. You means have. Mu means envy. Yu means fishing. Qing means feeling. Mu yu qing refers to the emotion the poet feels 
about the fisherman. That is, the envy he felt about the fisherman's gain. So the two lines read, "I'm sitting watching a fisherman. I can only envy him fishing." The poet is trying to be subtle about his intention of asking a favor from the premier Zhang Yue for a letter of recommendation. However, he completely failed to achieve his goal. What Meng Haoran intended to do was to express a admiration to the premier. However. These last two lines only imply that he wanted to join the bureaucratic ranks, but he said nothing about how he feels about the premier. For a Ganye poem, the poet was expected to praise the potential patron, whether it was his high social status, virtues, scholarly or military achievement, etc. Anything. That would flatter the egos of this potential patron. However, Meng Haoran did nothing of the sort in this poem. Meng Haoran probably thought that he had implied that Zhang Yue was open-minded and generous by describing the grand scenery of the Dongting Lake, but implied admiration is so weak. It is hard for Zhang Yue to work out from this poem. Of course, Meng Haoran should show off his talent, and the first four lines did a wonderful job for that. However, he should also declare his loyalty to the patron. Otherwise, his talent was not an asset for his patron, but a threat. Remember how Du Fu failed his second try at the National Civil Service Examination. The then Premier Li Linfu was so insecure that he failed everyone set for the exam. The last four lines as a Gan Ye poem is not successful at all. The expression of the request is so shy that he never said what he really wanted. And he just implied that he needed someone to help him to get a job. So the whole poem is kind of saying, "Look, I'm so talented. It would be your honor to help me to get a job." Of course, nothing happened after John got the poem. But we're lucky that we got a wonderful poem. <laughs> This rejection was quite a blow to Meng Haoran. He did not do much for his career except traveling around. In my next video, I'm going to continue my story about Meng Haoran and his friendship with Li Bai and Wang Wei. I'm also going to translate and analyze a poem Li Bai composed, praising Meng Haoran's talent and integrity, and one poem by Meng Haoran. Plus two couplets by Wang Changling and Meng Haoran allegedly composed at a poetry competition party. Plus how Meng Haoran ruined the best opportunity presented to him. That would be great fun. If you are new to my channel, please check out my other videos on classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, or medical literature. If you like the content of these videos. Please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online lessons on these subjects. So if you would like to read the original text, please contact me. Here is my email address. Otherwise, thanks for viewing my video, and I'll see you next time.